All right, are you there? Now everybody go to this website, the Mechanics C practice test. Let's do some examples. All right, um, go to 2004. Yep, 2004, we will start with problem number three. And that is the problem on the board, please. All right, let's get started, please. Are you there? Now, look up, please, look up. A uniform rod of mass capital M and length L is attached to a pivot of negligible friction as shown above. The pivot is located at a distance L over three from the left end of the rod. Express all answers in terms of given quantities and fundamental constants. A. Calculate the rotational inertia of the rod. Yes, please. For us to calculate the rotational inertia of the rod, um, this is, please note this before you do beginning as from now before you write any tests in ap physics there are some core concepts you must remember i don't need to put it in a study guide for you to study now the first thing you need you have the constant acceleration particle model you have the net force particle model here it's just Newton's second law of motion. You will always, you will always see this. This can just be represented by one equation V equal to VF plus the integral of A dt from zero to T. You have the momentum transfer model in which the summation of F is equal to zero, in which P final is equal to P initial. Keep in mind that this, this can still be rewritten as the impulse I equal to the change in momentum, <coughs> or PF is equal to PI, the integral of F dt from zero to T. And you know that this is impulse. You must know the total mechanical energy transfer model in which the total mechanical energy is constant. This is equal to Ke plus GPE plus EPE. And lastly, you need to know the net torque model in which the summation of torque is equal to I alpha which is equal to I d2 theta over dt squared. Now this can still be expressed as Jf equal to Ji uh, sorry this can still be expressed as LF equal to LI plus the integral of tau dt from 0 to t. This is angular momentum and this is angular impulse. Now, you must recall these concepts. They are central to AP physics and all questions can be answered <coughs> with these concepts. <coughs> If you can know, if you fundamentally you could understand this core model, if you could write it down on a sheet of paper and know what it stands for and review these concepts, trust me, you don't need to review. You could solve, virtually solve all problems with this. And if you've noticed from all my teaching, from all my classes, I begin by stating these concepts and everything is actually gotten from them. So your study guide will always include these concepts. This was done day one, and it repeated itself up till now. This, we spent almost a month on this, and almost a month on this, and they are the same thing. 
So if you can recall this, it will be very easy for you to recall everything in physics. Um, these are already revision tips I'm giving them to you. Um, so with that said, let's go back to our problem. We need to derive, calculate the rotational inertia of the object. Now, let me say this so that some of you should avoid asking questions in the next test because there will be questions like this. When you are asked to calculate, what is the difference between calculate and derive? There is a huge difference. When you are asked to calculate, determine, you can state a known formula and calculate your answers from that known formula. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. But when you are asked to derive, you cannot state a known formula and get your answer from that known formula. It will give you a zero. And when they say derive, by, prin by principle, when they say derive, you have to start from what? The first principles. And work your answer throughout. So in this solution, you are free one, when you, are, when you are asked to calculate the rotational inertia, I will almost always advise you to use the parallel axis theorem because it makes your life easy. Do you understand that? So let's do method one. Using the parallel axis theorem, you know that I is equal to ICM plus MD squared. Now, ICM, which is the moment of inertia about the center of mass of a rod, is given in the formula sheet and is 112 ml squared plus, this will be M bracket, um, the distance from, the, this is the pivot, the distance from, the, look up please. The distance from here to the center is one half L. So this distance from here to here will be what? One six. Most students during uh, use this distance and they were caught on fire. Don't make the same mistake. So this will be L over six all squared. And if you do all your manipulations, you will have 1 over 9 ml squared. This is using the parallel axis theorem. We can also use the method of integration, in which case I will be given by the integral of r squared dm. This will mean that you have here r squared, what is dm? Who can remember? Dm is lambda dx. But what is lambda? Lambda is m over capital L. So this is m over capital L, the integral of x squared dx. Now we are integrating from negative L, L over 3 to what? To 2L over 3. And if you perform your integration and substitute correctly, you have ml squared over 9. Now, remember this. Uh, let me say this. In the multiple choice, you, will, you may derive expressions for the moment of initial of every other shape. But before you walk into any exam, you should be able to derive by integration the moment of inertia of a uniform rod. That is the simplest, and you should know that. In the in the using any axis, go back and review what we did in class, because this is when when, when you analyze all the questions from 1974 to last year, <coughs> this is the most popular. As a matter of fact, this is the only question that they will ever ask you to that they that they have asked us of this moment. Um, the next question. The next question, let's go back to the question. Part B 
says that the rod is then released from rest from the position from the horizontal position shown above <coughs> we are asked to determine the period of oscillation so what is the approach here oh wait yeah that's part c part b is right there i love part b um part b says the rod is released from rest from the horizontal position shown above calculate the linear speed of the bottom end of the rod when the rod passes through the vertical position now there are two methods that you can do this and i showed both methods in class um, you could either use the law of conservation of energy or you can use newton's second law for rotation i would advise you well to me newton's second law for rotation is easy <coughs> But I'll advise you to use the law of conservation of energy because it will minimize the mistake you can mistakes you can make. So you have a rod. Let me go back to the diagram. This is how it will be. Great. Uh -huh. But you do agree with me that initially the rod is horizontal, and we have to calculate the speed when it's vertical. Now let me say this. The key to solving this problem is choosing an appropriate reference line. Personally, I would advise you to choose the reference line on position 2. So if this is our reference line, this would mean that the GPE along this line is 0. So the total energy at position 1 will be equal to zero because it's initially at rest plus mgh the total energy at position two will be half m v squared plus half i omega squared plus zero because we have chosen we have chosen position two to be at our reference point we know from the law of conservation of energy that the total energy at position 1 must be equal to the total energy at position 2. And if you agree with me, then we will have here mgh equal to 1 half mv squared. I'm going to put here vcm squared plus 1 half i omega squared. Now, fortunately for us, we have calculated i to be 1 9 ml squared now the trick is sometimes i is you are not asked to calculate i and most students will use the moment of inertia about the center of mass don't fall into that trick okay now be careful to use the moment of inertia about the axis of <coughs> rotation and, and, and it may not coincide with the center of mass of the rod <coughs> So, but what is H? Can somebody give me the value for H? Um, Austin thinks it's 2L over 3. Do you agree with him? This is, the, the center of mass is around there. What is H? It should be L over 6. Not 2L over 3. It should be L over 6. Because, let me, I, when I was in high school, I made the mistake of always thinking that the height will be the length of the rod, which is not true. Now, the rod behaves as if all the mass is concentrated at the center of mass. So it is the center of mass that matters. So if that is the case, then we have, then we will have MGL over 6 equal to 1 half MV squared plus 1 bracket 1 over 9 ML squared 
bracket v over v over r all squared. But what is r? What is r? Remember that v is equal to r omega, which means that omega is equal to v over r. What is this? What is that distance r? Is it one third? Is it one sixth of l, or is it two l over six? I'm listening, please. No. Pardon? No. Why do you think it's two l over three? If you can get this right, you always get these problems right. Alex, why do you think it's two l over three? Good. Now, did you get that? You are looking for the velocity of what? Of the bottom. So it is the distance from the bottom to where? To the pivot, which is 2L over 3. That was brilliant. Now, this gives us ML, MJL over 6 plus, sorry, equal to half MV squared plus. If you put L 2L over 3 there, you will end up with... Um, M. Let's simplify this. If you put 2L over 3, the 3 goes up to become 9. The 9 cancels. This is 1 half. <coughs> 1 over 9 ML squared. This is going to be V squared. Um, 2L over 3 is the same as 3 divided by 2L all squared. Um, can you say that again, please? I can. Uh, yeah, the M's can go away because it's common. But that's not that this guy here takes care of this. And uh, we will be left with GL over 6 equal to v square over 2 plus this is 2 squared is 4 times 2 will give us 8 <coughs> v squared because the else will cancel um, we can multiply throughout we are looking for for v anyway so we can multiply throughout by 8. So we will have 3 over 2 GL equal to 5 V squared. Am I correct? This goes there. That is 4 V squared plus 1. That's 5 V squared. And that simplifies V will be equal to the square root of 3 over 10 gl now look up please part c asks us to calculate the period of oscillation the period of oscillation is given by 2 pi the square root of i divided by mgd we did derive this last class which you will need to know that d is l over 6 so this implies that t is 2 pi the square root of m l square over 9 divided by m g l over 6 um, you can simplify that and if you simplify that will give you 2L all divided by 3G. Some of, one of the most common mistakes students will think is they will assume that this system is a simple pendulum <coughs> and they will be awarded no credit if they use a simple pendulum, if they think it is a simple pendulum. All right, let me do this problem, please. We did this problem last semester but I'm just gonna modify it a little bit we have two blocks one on top of each other um, if you if you did the homework you will recognize that you had a problem like this um, 
This system oscillates back and forth with simple harmonic motion. The question is, what must be the maximum acceleration that such a system can have so that the two blocks stay together? So that the two blocks stay together. Now, in the next test, if, if, if in order for you to prepare well for the next test, there will be a problem with springs. And I love two block problems, so pay attention. The first step is we need to draw a free body diagram. Let's start with the block on top. If it's oscillating, remember that there is a, a force in that direction, the spring force Fs. There is no friction, but for this block to stay on top, there must be friction. And the friction force will be acting. Will it be acting backward or forwards? When will the friction force be pointing backwards? When the system, this is a tricky question. When will the static friction be pointing backwards? Now, note the following, please. In any two block system, listen carefully. For the system to move as one, the relative velocity between the two systems must be zero. And if the relative velocity is zero, therefore the type of friction that exists between those systems is static. Alright, look up please before we leave. This force will be acting backwards if the system is moving backwards. And that force will be acting forward if the system is moving forward. So the static friction force always points in the direction of what? Motion for the two block system. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Now we are concerned only with the block on top. We know that N is equal to mg and we know that Fs is equal to mu s mg. Now this is the force that provides, this is the restoring force acting on the block on top. And if that is the case, then we know that Fs will be equal to what? Negative or m omega square x. Do you understand that? Now, this means that f maximum will be equal to um, m omega square a, where <coughs> a is the maximum amplitude of oscillation. All of this will be equal to mu s mg. We could take care of that, and uh, you will see that mu square a will be equal to what mu s which implies that omega squared will be equal to mu s all divided by a we know that the acceleration is equal to what negative omega square x yes please that means that that means the velocity is zero and the acceleration is maximum you understand that right recall acceleration is maximum at amplitude and the velocity is <laughs> zero at amplitude. Omega is just two pi over t, just a constant. Let's let's pick up from here next class, please.